All right, we were just encountering the time frame when we find <coughs> Jacob now has two wives, and he's actually been given one of the slaves as uh, for Rachel's offering in order for her to be able to claim descendants. And so I want to just look back for a minute at the names that were chosen, because it's very revealing. The scripture sort of says what it says. It says in verse 30, or uh, yeah, 31 of chapter 29, uh, the Lord saw Leah was unloved, and he opened her womb, <clears throat> but Rachel was unable to have children. Leah conceived and gave birth to a son and named him Reuben, because the Lord had seen my affliction. Surely now my husband will love him. Well, the, the name Reuben actually literally means in Hebrew, behold, a son. And so she's longing for this affection, for this love of her husband. And so she names the son, behold, a son. And so it's like such a, you know, indication of this is what I'm giving you, you know, this is what you, you know, and this, and, and so that, you know, I think is, is absolutely wonderful. And then she conceived and gave birth to a son named Reuben, because the Lord has seen my affliction, surely, okay. She conceived again and gave birth to a son and said, because the Lord has heard that I am unloved, and he has therefore given me a son also. And she, so she called him Simeon. And Simeon literally means to hear. So she's been petitioning God that these sons are going to give, turn the affections toward her that she's been longing for from the very start. Now, obviously, she was complicit in the deceit of being a substitute <laughs> for, the, for the proper person. So she and Laban had colluded together, and she couldn't, it couldn't have happened without her being in agreement with that. But she probably loved Jacob the whole time anyway. She probably looked at him longingly and was thinking that perhaps this would... Uh, so we'll get on to the third one. And she conceived again and gave birth to the son... Now my time, now this time my husband will become attached to me because I have borne him three sons. Therefore she named him Levi. And Levi literally means to join or unite. And so again, with every time she the name is called, she's basically a, 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 reinforcing the petition, love me, please love me, be united with me. Even in the naming of her children, she's just, I, I, it's, you know, really, she conceived again and gave birth to a son, and this time I will praise the Lord. Therefore, she named him Judah, which means praise or the praised one. So now she has four offspring there. Uh, as we look at what happened next, when Rachel gave uh, her slave for Jacob, um, in verse 4 of chapter 30, so she gave her slave Bilhah as a wife, and Jacob had relationship with her. Bilhah conceived and bore Jacob a son. And Rachel says, God has vindicated me and indeed heard my voice and given me a son. So even though it's the slave woman's offspring, she's claiming it has a son. Who names the child? We don't have Jacob naming any of the children until the last, where he oversees what Rachel had declared initially. But So now we have the slave woman who gave birth to the child. She's not going to name the child. Rachel's going to name the child. So, and Dan literally means, God is my judge. And that's the, the name. Um, God has vindicated me. I was, I guess, she thought of herself as incomplete, insufficient, unable to produce, and God has judged and found in the 
produce of this womb, which is not her own, but there is a male offspring that she's now claiming, that God has judged and, and vindicated her. <coughs> her. Um, and then the last one was, and Rachel's slave Bilhah conceived again and bore Jacob a second son. So Rachel said, with mighty wrestling, I have wrestled with my sister and I have indeed prevailed. And she named him Naphtali. And so, they, and literally that means wrestling or struggling. The name means that. And so you have these women that are in the names of their children expressing themselves. And then each time the name is declared, it's like, okay, Leah has her things. Her, basically, she's seeking after the um, love and affection. And, and, and I, I think it's great the way they uh, have named their children. And it's such an expression of what it was they were looking for and wanting out of this situation. But it also can create problems within those brothers, <laughs> as it were. How are we going to get along? And, and we see later with Joseph, mm, these guys are not exactly thrilled with him. So when Leah stopped having children, this is where we left off last week. Uh, when Leah saw that she had stopped having children, she took her slave, Zilpah, and gave her to Jacob as a wife, and Leah's slave Zilpah bore Jacob a son. Then Leah said, how fortunate. So she named him Gad, um, which literally means good fortune. So now there's four offspring, male offspring that she's claiming, and there's a fifth. And again, the slave woman is not naming the child. Leah's naming the child. Jacob's not naming any of the children. Leah is at this point again. Leah's slave Zilpah bore Jacob a second son, and Leah said, Happy <coughs> am I, for the woman will call me happy. So she named him Asher, so, which literally means happy, <laughs> or happy one. So you've got her having produced four offspring on her own, and then her slave is doing this, but it's almost like each additional now is uh, once again, an affront against Rachel, where there, this competition is going on, and Jacob is being shuttled from tent to tent. <laughs> oh, I don't think he's that upset about <laughs> He didn't. We don't know that he's complaining at this point. But uh, anyway, that's that's where it is. So we've got all this dynamic going on within this household. The, um, and again, don't know, my sense is that they were in fairly quick succession, the births, because we've got within the, the first seven years that Jacob was indentured, essentially he didn't have an opportunity for children. The next seven years he did, and then he worked six more years, but at the end of those six years he had 11 offspring between the two wives well, between the four wives, the two slave wives and his two actual wives. So all 11 children were born in that 13-year period between the seven-year and that. And so uh, we, we've got that playing out. So in, in verse 14 of chapter 30, Now in the days of the wheat harvest, Reuben went and found mandrake, mandrake fruits in a field and brought them to his mother Leah. Then Rachel said to Leah, please give me some of your son's mandrakes. But she said to her, okay, anybody know what the history behind the mandrake is? Or the, the indication of why this would be significant? Okay, mandrakes were believed to have certain properties. As far as medicinal properties, but also fertility properties. And so the... People of the, of the era valued them for anesthetic and sedative purposes, laxative purposes, and then fertility enhancing capability. So you have these two women, Rachel, who's never been able to conceive. She's on scene when Reuben, probably not that old, 
comes walking in from a field where wheat's being harvested. But these things are growing wild at that point, and that would be the time frame when they come to maturity. So within that plant, that mandrake plant, apparently there's this small apple-like fruit that is a product of that, and that's what he's bringing, is a collection of fruit. Don't know how many, and <laughs> Rachel doesn't ask for all of them. She just asks for some. Please give me some. And so there's a lot of ideas that, okay, perhaps, and, and now you get the, the significant response from Leah here, because if in fact she's, they're both thinking that there's a possibility of fertility being enhanced, Leah's dried up, Rachel's never had children, and there's the possibility of some fertility provision here. And so um, Leah's, uh, <coughs> Leah's response to her then is, is it a small matter for you to take my husband? And would you take my son's mandrakes also? And so Rachel said, there f- uh, so Rachel said, therefore he may sleep with you tonight in return for your son's mandrakes. So she's, <laughs> she wants these mandrakes. Obviously, Jacob has made it his habit of sleeping with Rachel. That's where he's normally going to be. And how this plays out is just... Um, In the beginning, Rachel was the primary. Yeah. She's the loved one. And so when Jacob came in from the field that evening, Leah went out to meet him. <laughs> Just, you must have relations with me, for I have indeed hired you with my son's mandrakes. Okay. It's like, just the idea that this man never names any of his children, and then he's, in the manner in which he responds to these women, it's like, okay. Yep. <laughs> so he slept with her that night. God listened to Leah. And she conceived and bore Jacob a fifth son. Then Leah said, God has given me my reward because I gave my slave to my husband. So she named him Issachar, which is literally to hire. I hired my husband, and here's the product of hiring my husband. <laughs> This child. <laughs> so, and Leah conceived again and bore a sixth son. So don't know if he's transferred his place of sleeping, but it's probably at least nine months and a year down the road where he again is having relations with Leah. Don't know what all the dynamics are within the household at this point. But again, he's obviously sleeping with Leah um, Leah conceived again and brought a sixth son to, and Leah said God has endowed me with a good gift finally my husband will acknowledge me as his wife because I have borne him six sons so she named him Zebulon afterwards she gave birth to a daughter and named her Dinah Zebulon then is exalted or uh, dwelling of honor so you've got this one, she's confident. This surely will win the affections of my husband. I will be that first wife instead of being always the one that's in the background. And so that's, she's chosen to name him then the exalted or the dwelling of honor. Dana, or Dinah is the only daughter we have named and there's, it's entirely possible that there were other, were other daughters that were a product of these various marriages. But the only one that we hear is Dinah. And we're going to hear her name later again. And that may be why we have her identified at this point. But her name would be God will judge or vindication. So that her daughter, that she's now had given birth to six boys. When the daughter's there, she's naming the daughter. Um, God will judge or vindication. What was 
Rachel's thing about the thing is I've been vindicated. And so she names her daughter Dinah. And the family dynamics here are just like, <laughs> glad I wasn't there. <laughs> so anyway, that's how that... Um, then in verse 22, then God remembered Rachel. And God listened to her and opened her womb. So she conceived and gave birth to a son and said, God has taken away my disgrace. And she named him Joseph, saying, may the Lord give me another son. Um, Joseph literally means God will add. And so she's now produced one offspring, one son, and she names this one God will add. And, you know, it's as though she's saying, we're not done. God, we're not done. Jacob, we're not done. Um, and so I, I think the naming is uh, just neat. So in verse 25, now it came about when Rachel had given birth to Joseph that Jacob said to Laban, send me away so that I may go to my own place in my own country. Give me my wives and my children for whom I have served you, let me go, for you yourself know my service, which I have rendered you. But Laban said to him, If it pleases you at all, stay with me. I have determined by divination that the Lord has blessed me on your account. Um, divination. Now, there's not... The law has not been established. There's no clear thing, but there's entirely possible. What was it that he was, when, when Jacob took off and something was taken from his home, what was it that he was outraged about? His household gods. So he obviously has made references, and he will make more references to Yahweh, to God. But he also has other gods, and other inclinations with regard to things. So he's, I think it was obvious just by looking at the produce of what Jacob had done since he'd been there, but he's actually sought out some other source of confirmation that the reason that you're so blessed is Joseph, or Jacob rather. Jacob yeah, being there. Um, well, if you count the grandkids' blessings... <laughs> there you go. Um, and he continued, Name me your wages, and I will give them. And Jacob said to him, You yourself know how I have served you, and how your livestock have fared with me. For you had little before I came, and it has increased to a multitude. And the Lord has blessed you wherever I turn. But now... When shall I provide for my own household also? So he said, what shall I give you? And Jacob said, you shall not give me anything. This is a little confusing, this next section here. But if you will do this one thing for me, I will again pasture and keep your flock. <coughs> so he's going to take over the maintenance and the care for the flocks of Laban. And he said, the one thing I want. So what's, what's he asking for here? Um, There's genetics before genetics was even. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Spotted, speckled, and yeah. darker ones. Let me pass through your entire flock today, <clears throat> removing from there every speckled or spotted sheep and every black sheep among the lambs and every spotted speckled sheep of the goats. Those shall be my wages. Now, he's not asking for those. What he's asking is that we're going to take this minority that is a rare occurrence in the flock, and we're going to separate those out. And you're going to, what's going to happen is Laban's going to take those three days' journey, and they're going to stay with his son. The remainder of the flock and the herds that Jacob is going to oversee are going to be without any of those imperfections. And so what's going to happen is when this plays out, his oversight of the flocks 
every time a speckler spotted is born in Laban's flocks that he's now overseeing, they become Jacob's. <clears throat> so he's not saying, I want this right now, because he's already said, I, you don't have to give me anything right now. But what he's doing is he's saying, this minority, which may be only 5% or 10% of all the herds, are rare, take them off. And anything that's subsequent that comes up in your herds that fulfills this description then becomes Jacob's. And so Jacob's then has a plan, and he talks about later that he had a vision about this whole thing too. But anyway, so... So um, like Laban's thinking, he's going to get rid of all these, we're going to move out all these spotted ones. And we've just called we've just called the herd. Yeah. And he's not gonna get anything now. Yeah, that's the thing. This proposal looks so attractive to Jacob because Laban. Oh, oh. It looks so so attractive to, to Laban because he knows that that's the rare occurrence for out of you know fifty sheep, you might have one with spotted or speckled or whatever the percentage was. But he knows that that's the rare occurrence in that in the in those animals, and so that now he's taken out however many, but he's put them three days journey away with his son, so that now not only are they not there, they're not going to be able to interbreed with Laban's flocks. Yeah. And so, even though it's a rare genetic circumstance, he's you know he's fairly confident that okay, that's that's the exception. And so, you're right about the genetics thing. It was, uh, but but that's why it would be so attractive to Laban because look, if if, if all the spotted and speckled ones are over there, my flocks are going to remain pure. They're not going to have that genetic <coughs> propensity. And even though they didn't know about genetics, they knew about. Jacob yeah. knew, though. Jacob knew. He knew how to get the uh, speckles and stripes and such. So, that's that's how that thing plays out. Um, let me pass through your entire flock today, removing every speckle, da-da-da-da-da-da. So, my honesty will answer for me later when you come concerning my wages. <coughs> so, he's taking care of Laban's flocks, and now... When, when he discovers any of these speckled, spotted, whatever, among his things, he knows, my kids, my sons have got the other ones over here, so they must be now Jacob's. And so, everyone that is not speckled or spotted among the goats and black among the lambs, if found with me, will be considered stolen. So... What, what Jacob's also doing is, out of Laban's flocks, when they are speckled or spotted, he's separating them out. So he's beginning to create his own flocks. He's still overseeing Laban's flocks and herds. He's taken on that responsibility. That's part of the deal. I'm going to oversee your stuff, but every time one of these others is born, they're mine. And they're going to remain separate. So... Laban said, good, let it be according to your word. So he removed on that day the striped and spotted goats and da 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 uh, Everyone with the white on it and all the black ones among the sheep and put them in the care of his son and he put a distance of three day journey between himself and Jacob and Jacob fed the rest of Laban's flocks. So that's the deal. And as a, as a result, <clears throat> Jacob took fresh rods of poplar and, and all of that, all he's really doing is, during the time of mating, when the animals are coming to feed, or to water themselves, to be refreshed, and it's a mating season, then he's placing a visual thing in front of them, that, and it's, he, he gets very clever about the whole thing, exposing the white that was in the rods, and he set the rods which were peeled in the front of the flocks in the drinking troughs, that is, in the watering channels where the flocks came to drink, and they mated when they came to drink. So the flocks mated by the rods, and the flocks delivered striped, speckled, or spotted offspring. Then Jacob separated the lambs and made the flocks face toward the striped, and all the black in the flock in 
a flock of Laban, and he put his own herds apart, did not put them with Laban's flock. Moreover, whenever the stronger of the flock were mating, Jacob would place the rod in the sight of the flock in the drinking troughs so that they would mate by the rods. But when the flock was sickly, he did not put them in, so the sickly were Laban's and the stronger were Jacob's. And the man became exceedingly prosperous and had large flocks and female and male servants and camels and donkeys. So this whole thing, the way it played out, Laban thinks, I'm getting this good deal. <laughs> and Jacob basically is tremendously enriched, and his are healthier animals. He's, he's figured out how to um, basically use some creative genetic um, uh, uh, anticipation of how this is going to play out. Later, Laban's sons would accuse him of stealing them. Yes, mm -hmm. they, they must have been stolen. But they were in charge of the flocks that were already in a, in a minority at that point. But what ended up happening is the majority ended up being the description that was agreed upon. And uh, um, the thing about this whole thing is as he was doing this, and he's not only getting larger herds, he's getting stronger herds. Because what's going to happen in a, in a short time? He's going to travel with them all. He's going to be taking them long distance, 600 miles in mass. And so he needs strong, he needs very healthy animals in order to basically make this move. And so his whole uh, life is enriched by this. He's got servants, he's got, you know, slaves, he's got what will be 11 sons and one daughter that we know of. <coughs> So that's um, uh, chapter 30. Let me see where we are. We, we only have tonight and next week. And so we're going to wrap up pretty much with, with Jacob. We may not get into all the details, but that's going to be the end of the, the patriarchs that we were <clears throat> that I was asked to cover for this, um, this section. Now Jacob heard the words, of Laban's son saying, Japheth has taken away all of was that was our father's, and from what belonged to our father he has made all this wealth. And Jacob saw the attitude of Laban, and behold, it was not friendly toward him as it had been before. Then the Lord said to Jacob, Return to the land of your fathers and to your relatives, and I will be with you. So Jacob sent word and called Rachel and Leah to his flock in the field. Said to them, I see your father's attitude. It is not friendly toward me as it was before, but the God of my father has been with me. You know that I have served your father with all my strength, yet your father has cheated me and changed my wages ten times. However, God did not allow him to do me harm. If he said this, the speckled shall be your wages, then all the flocks delivered speckled. And if he said this, the striped shall be your wages, then all the flocks delivered were striped. So God has given away your father's livestock and given them to me. And it came about at the time when the flock were breeding that I raised my eyes and saw in a dream. And behold, the male goats that were mating were striped, speckled, or mottled. And then the angel of God said to me in a dream, Jacob... And I said, here I am. And he said, now raise your eyes and see that all the male goats that are mating are striped, speckled, or mottled. For I have seen everything that Laban has been doing to you. And I, the God of Bethel, where you anointed the memorial stone, where you made the vow to me. We went through that where he slept on the pillow and then he actually gets the Abrahamic promise delivered in a dream. And then he makes a promise that if, in fact, everything that comes, comes out will be, I will be your servant and you will be my God. Now arise and leave this ranch land and return to the land of your birth. Rachel and Leah said to him, Do we still have any share or inheritance in our father's house? Are we not regarded by him as foreigners? For he has sold us and has also entirely consumed our purchase price. 
Surely all the wealth that God has taken away from our Father belongs to us and our children. Now then, do whatever God has told you. Then Jacob stood up, put his children and his wife on camels, and he drove away all his livestock and all his property, which he had acquired, the livestock he possessed, which he had acquired in Padam Aram, to go to the land of Canaan to his father Isaac. Laban had gone to shear his flock. Rachel stole the household idols that were her father's, and Jacob deceived Laban, the Aramean, by not telling him that he was fleeing. So he fled with all he had. He got up and he crossed the Euphrates River and set out for a hill country of Gilead. So he's got a 600-mile journey with huge number of flocks, lots of servants. They're going to be moving at a fairly slow pace. Still takes Laban seven days to catch him with his sons when he comes. And he gave them notice back in the spring or autumn when he's breeding all these animals and yeah. saying, this is I'm preparing to leave. <coughs> and now they've, they've dropped all this offspring, so he's had plenty of those. Oh years. yeah, and, and it was inevitable that um, and, and essentially this pursuit thing, as it plays out, But you can see how it's still seeing the Laban that he was being <coughs> sneaky and was trying to escape and get away with something. Well, and, and he's not complaining about the flocks. It's, he's saying, you've stolen my daughters and my grandchildren. They're mine. They're my daughters. They're my grandchildren. And so, his, you know, his, but he gets a warning from God. Laban does before he, he encounters uh, Jacob. So we'll get there. Um, when Laban was informed on the third day that Jacob had fled, he took his kinsmen with him and pursued him a distance seven days' journey, overtook him on the hill country of Gilead. However, God came to Laban, the Aramean, in a dream of the night and said to him, Be careful. Do not speak to Jacob either good or bad. Don't make a judgment one way or another on this. <coughs> Um, and Laban caught up with Jacob. Now Jacob had pitched his tent in the hill country. Laban with his kinsmen camped in the hill country of Gil Gilead. It may be on different hills. And Laban said to Jacob, What have you done by deceiving me and carrying away my daughters like captives of the sword? Why did you flee secretly and deceive me and did not tell me so that I might have sent you away with joy? and with songs, with tambourines, and with lyres, and did not allow me to kiss my grandchildren and my daughters. Now you have done foolishly. It is in my power to do you harm. But the God of your father spoke to me last night, saying, be careful not to speak either good or bad to Jacob. Now you have indeed gone away because you have longed greatly for your father's house. But why did you steal my gods? So he's expressed his anger and upset over the fact that basically Jacob snuck off in the night. With, with the, but the, the gods thing is now, all right, this I can raise as a legitimate objection. Somebody stole from me. Up till this time, Everything that Jacob has taken was his by an agreement. They had a contract with one another. And so, and Jacob has no clue that Rachel made off with the, with the gods. Um, is it time? Okay, guys. You know, we're to the best part. <laughs> I know. We'll get back there next week. <coughs> we'll close it out.